Dolite civil rights group called EFFI. We're two guys from Finland who founded this organization like uh, two years ago. My name is Mikko and he's Ville. Uh, what we're trying to tell you is uh, what we actually did there in Finland and how could we influence the Finnish lawmakers and Finnish policymakers and uh, in recent times also European wide activity, what has happened in Brussels and uh, what we are trying to do there to stop the innovation threatening laws and similar kind of proposals. What you also have in, here in the US are now like spreading into Europe. Uh, a few words about our name. We are not related to EFF in any official sense. We just fair use their trademark. <laughs> it's like Electronic Frontier Finland. And uh, when we founded this organization, I just browsed the domain name database and uh, found out that that's a pretty interesting domain name. It's almost EFF. We can be like confused with EFF. We are having like similar goals and similar values, but uh, of course, we are an independent organization in a very little country far away from here. So maybe we just try it with their good name. Here's some kind of background with official figures what has happened so far. So we were founded in September two, 2001. It was something like two weeks before the attacks. Or even less, it was one week and a bit more. That was just coincidence. Now we have over 300 members. Uh, we are like members who support the organization. All members like pay membership fees annually and uh, they do actively participate in what we do. And the number has been growing like steadily. I think we have like 350, may maybe 400 members now. Most are from Finland, but we also have international members nowadays. I could guess something like less than 10% are international members from different countries, even from the United States. Uh, so the, the <coughs> kind of brain, brain work what happens in EFFI is done by a small board. We have like, let's say eight board members and then a couple other guys who are very like interesting and do volunteer work there. Uh, in the beginning we, we were just like two or three guys but now it's like 10 active, active, active guys who do, do something to push this message for, forward. And most of us are working at the universities in Finland and also in some companies there. Uh, this is, of course, volunteer work. No money is involved. O <coughs> only the money we get in as donations we use to uh, put some, like, uh, like, like public stuff up. Actually, latest pro project <coughs> I'm trying to push forward is to establish three Wi-Fi hotspots in Finland with our money we have gathered from members and uh, donations. But so far. What we have done is basically that we have commented law proposals doing all kinds of paperwork, trying to put media releases out if there is some new law proposal out there and what we think about it. Maybe the two most important law proposals so far we have commented and really changed have been the copyright proposal, similar kind that you have the DMCA here, and another one was about like a free speech issues. I think we have some slides on those. Later on, yeah. Okay, later. Uh, this is something about our European-wide network we have been trying to build during the couple of last years. Uh, so we have like cooperated with EFF on some issues and uh, other organizations, organizations here in the U.S. <coughs> and also in Europe. Uh, in 2002, we founded a, one European-wide coalition network and that tries to influence stuff in the Brussels. We have some more about it later. Uh, it's with European digital rights. And then you have global internet liberty campaign. It's like uh, everywhere. It doesn't have national borders, although it doesn't have a uh, like a legal presence anywhere either. Uh, our homepage is there. <laughs> you can go there and buy our merchandise and all kinds of stuff. We actually have T-shirts here. We don't sell them there, but after this presentation, we can perhaps show you something. Uh, here are some statistics on membership development, which has been quite steady. Uh, I think the most important steps here have been 
somewhere in the middle. In the beginning, we got something like 50 members quite easily. Those were the most active guys who like uh, were on the mailing list and discussed these topics. What happens when copyright broadens? What happens if you have a patent, the software patent in Europe and that kind of stuff? But when we got media releases true in major new p newspapers and also on television, then we started to gain a more, more like members who are generally interested in these issues. Not just tech, tech people, but also like uh, journalists and uh, teenagers who like think those guys are cool and doing something important but really don't understand the issues. <coughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> they don't hear this presentation, they are far away. <laughs> okay, I think... At least hopefully. Yeah. Some, somebody takes a video there, but I don't know where it goes. To. And now we have, as I said, something like 350, maybe 400 members. As a DF have, some, have something like 10,000. At least they claim. <laughs> but you never know of those figures. Okay. But EF, EFF has been in, uh, has been around like more than 10 years, and we have been just two years putting our stuff up. Uh, here are some like uh, rationale. Why should you have a member organization? We have been like talking with lots of different groups who do the same kind of stuff as we do. In almost every European country, there is a similar kind of group compared to ours. I, I also guess that in, U in the United States, in different states, you have different kind of little groups, grassroots organizations. You have this EFF, which is, which is like nationwide. But many of these groups are not like uh, member supporting in a real sense. There are just like a couple of guys who put the organization up and try to do some media media releases and that kind of stuff. And what we have like found is that this approach doesn't last very long. When the original founders and those who are like interested, they, they, they do something else, they grow up or <laughs> something something else, then it just like uh, fades out. Maybe it's a similar thing or you can compare it in, in some sense to open source development. You have to have a real community which can like uh, uh, make the make the thing live on. So what you have to do if you want to put up a new organization or you want to make an existing organization like thriving, I guess you get you have to get out of the closet and really like get real. Say that there's some some people you represent. There's like hundreds of people you are speaking of, not just yourself and your ideas. If you want to make like political influence, of course, it's a different thing if you want to hack a website or something like that. It's another approach, but we are not doing that officially. Um, <laughs> so the idea is really to get active members. How to get active members, it's, it's, it's magic how to get them. I don't know. We have like a 10 to 15 maybe active members totally. We have 400 members totally, but just 10 to 15 do something like which count, which counts. You want to say something about this slide? Yeah, um, here's uh, some dates and uh, as you can see we managed to get the flying start and uh, well of course it's uh, quite easy to get in Finland to media compared to the United States, especially national level because in Finland uh, uh, we actually have only four national TV stations and that's about it when we have some small cable, uh, cable TV stations which are mostly in bankruptcy at the moment so the TV scheme in Finland is um, quite small and uh, as a result especially Mikko has been a lot of in different talk shows and uh, different interviews and uh, every time practically something happens which relates to counter security or uh, copyright or whatever privacy questions uh, reporters nowadays call us this is of course very practical because we don't uh, necessarily even have to send any more any press releases or anything but we know instantly that uh, we have comments and uh, uh, we are ready to present them in TV or whatever. And uh, also uh, we was very lucky that uh, we managed to get to the parliament from very early on or we have been uh, participating from inside the political system instead of um, just trying to influence from media uh, we have been participating uh, in the parliamentary hearings and uh, that's much more effective because the politicians 
uh, actually even respond uh, if you have something clever or phrasable to say. And for example, uh, I guess the biggest uh, hit was when uh, 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 we managed to be on uh, the, uh, during the time the copyright law was uh, handled in the parliament, we both actually were inv invited to give our testimonies and uh, I think we made a difference there. And uh, actually, yes, um, that um, copyright law was, uh, copyright law thing was actually part of the fight against the UCD is, uh, as some of you might know, it's practically similar law and uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, all of that is actually worse. Um, it doesn't have really any kind of fair use exemption for, uh, for example, for digital rights management if uh, works are selling internet. And, uh, well, this comes from European Union, but uh, nevertheless the national states don't have any other option than to uh, create a national law, law out of it. And, uh, well, in Finland we had an uh, especially heinous one as a first version, uh, but luckily, uh, well, we are actually both studying copyright, so we were quite well informed what's going on and uh, started to blocking it from early on and uh, actually managed to get some success because in, uh, in the end uh, the Finnish parliament sent the law back because it was so bad. And I think that uh, this shows that uh, it's really possible if you have good arguments to uh, tell politicians that uh, uh, there is such a thing as a too strong uh, intellectual property regime. Uh, of course, there was some other reason why that law was sent back. For example, the parliament had practically run out of time and uh, they didn't have a chance to uh, start uh, making uh, replacement to the law or try to make it better. Uh, and, uh, yeah, this one of the parts, Mikko, you might to add some comments. What is on the next slide? Oh, yes. Yeah, actually, we, we had this slash of posting which got through, like, a <clears throat> when we, like, a block the law proposal at the Finnish parliament, the corporate law proposal. Uh, of course, there was, like Willa said, there were, there were lots of things because, it, uh, the, the, for the reason, it was blocked. But what happened in the end was that we like claimed victory. We also claimed victory in the Finnish media. And the thing is that the Finnish uh, parliament, it was changed during the last spring. They got new elections there. And now that we have like claimed victory before, now they have like uh, sent us letters and uh, they have like invited us to the sessions when they draft the new law from the beginning. Beginning so we can like influence it even more in the future. Okay, this is just Finland. It's a very tiny country, and we have the European-wide stuff happening in every European country, and uh, our power to influence other, other countries in Europe is limited. What we can perhaps do is to influence uh, European Union in Brussels, and of course there, if, you, if we have even the mandate of the Finland, the country, it's just like uh, five million people, it's uh, peanuts. There are countries like uh, United Kingdom and Germany which have like 50 to 100 million people living there and a uh, much stronger economy. Anyway, what's next? Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, uh, because it's an EU di directive, uh, it means that uh, sooner or later Finland has to uh, transpose it to the national law and uh, the fight goes on. We just got a new version out and as Mick already told, uh, we are this time part invited to participate to the crafting, so we hope to create, make it better. Hacking won't be a crime in Finland, according to our pre press releases, at least. So, <clears throat> here's another law proposal which we really like change in the Finnish parliament. Uh, this was like a local law proposal, not that interesting in international sense. <coughs> but anyway, there, there was the idea that uh, to, to censor all material published on the internet, and uh, it, it was based on a very old law in Finland where it was required that all, all press is like uh, censored by the state. It related back to the times when Finland was under Russia and there was a Russian char governing in Finland and they want to control everything that was published in Finland, in Finnish press, that nobody publishes any, any material like which, which is against the char power. 
well, that's perhaps a bit extreme. E extreme, but that, that's where the origin of the law. Now the law had, has, all, <coughs> of course, changed during the times, and uh, the latest version, like, uh, was or what is now active or law enforcing in Finland says that uh, every newspaper must have an edi editor in chief and must like monitor what is what is published even in the uh, letters to the editor pages and so on and if there's something like uh, infring infringing published then the editor in chief in, in principle liable for that and they wanted to extend this law to the internet where basically any web page would have needed an editor in chief which would have needed to be like uh, over 18 years old, the legal age in Finland, and would be liable for anything published under those web pages, even like chat pages and all kind of kind of interactive content. So there was some requirement. You had to argue, argue <coughs> all web publications for three months and uh, have 18-year-old editor-in-chief, and you had to log all traffic, which was happening in interactive sites like chat sites and everything by the law. If you didn't like uh, qualify these things, then in, in principle, police could have came and uh, pulled the plug, pulled yeah. the plug of your servers. Yeah, especially because it was a criminal liability, not just civil. Right. And there was no like definition what is web publication. Any web page would have like uh, required these things. Yeah, it, it was more or less something like if you update your web page uh, periodic uh, more or less, I, I would say, quite often it would have been a publication in a sense of gold version. So we, what we were able to do is like to already uh, uh, also get heard in the parliament like with the corporate law proposal uh, and uh, we also like joined ISPs, we called them and asked what, what they wanted to do. Of course ISPs didn't want that uh, people were we had more burdens to publish web pages. ISPs wanted people to publish more and more material online. And we had lo lots of lobbying happening there. There was the International Chamber of Commerce, which also like uh, joined our activities and published their press release and tried to influence members of parliament. And then we were heard in the Constitutional Law Committee, and there the chair of the committee like was very like polite to us, and she asked that what is exactly what you want there? How do we write this law? And they really like changed the law as we wanted it to, to be changed. And uh, almost all of those crazy requirements were dropped off. And the uh, like uh, definition of web publication was like uh, clarified. That it only, only means like traditional press. If you have a big newspaper, their web pages have those requir requirements they had before, as they were in printed press. Actually, we got some international press releases also out based on this little acumen there. <coughs> what else do we have? Yeah, then we have like uh, given these big brother awards also in Finland. Uh, this was from the latest award ceremony. We got one member of the parliament, this fellow here, to give the awards. Uh, and of course, the recipient is the famous one. This is uh, just a stormtrooper. Water wasn't there. I guess he is in the United States somewhere. Uh, the winner of the Big Brother Awards this year was <coughs> a very big telecom company. Uh, it's nowadays called Telia Sonera. It's like a Swedish Finnish merger between two state owned ISPs. It penetrates the market, which has like 50% or something similar of all ISP mobile phone connections. Uh, what they have done so far, before they got this prestigious award, was that uh, their top like management uh, had uh, snooped uh, mo mobile phone traffic. They they listen to your phones. They also read your email. They did all, all this classic stuff. And it was the top management, like CEOs and heads of corporate communications, all well like jailed. That, that, that was pretty heavy stuff. Uh, so everything we could do is just to give them the big brother. What else? I don't know. The firm still like uh, runs runs quite heavily. They are listed on Nasdaq. 
So you have something about this? Yeah. And uh, as we have quite a few times already mentioned, uh, Finland has to uh, transpose all the directives from European Union, and as a result, uh, our, even if we are successful in lobbying in Finland, it doesn't really help because we have to be able to lobby in Brussels. And uh, uh, that was the reason why we have been all pushing for EFF Europe from early on. And uh, it actually came through in 2002 uh, as uh, the most ambitious groups in Europe uh, managed to finally found uh, European digital rights. And uh, uh, I'm actually at the moment a member of board of our, that organization, uh, which uh, unfortunately doesn't really work even at the moment very well. Um, uh, we, don't, uh, we have some working groups uh, being founded right now, which are open for individuals. Otherwise, it's uh, just for member organiza or national organizations. And uh, besides that, there is luckily some something else going, also, going on also in Europe. Or some of you might have heard about uh, Euro Linux Alliance, which is lobbying against software patents and uh, is actually very successful in it. And we have been also participating to that effort in Finland. And uh, at the moment it actually seems possible that in Europe, uh, uh, at least the European Parliament will vote against uh, full software patenting. It will be possible to patent software as a part of a device or, for example, part of mobile phone, but uh, uh, not anymore as uh, doesn't, it's not anymore possible to get pure software patents. Uh, well, anyway, the deci deciding vote is on September, so there's going to be quite heavy lobbying, lobbying going on over the next one and a half months, I guess. And we are actually trying to get Linus Turvals to also participate in the lobbying, which is, of course, never reached us because he hates uh, uh, lobbying, lobbying and politics. But anyway, he's a uh, person who might have also a lot of influence in Parliament. So in the end, I wouldn't be that pessimistic that we, we couldn't like influence in Brussels too. Uh, it takes, of course, longer time to have some power in there. There's like over 500 members of the parliament in Brussels from different countries in Europe. There's like a set 12 or something member countries at the moment, and now they like expand uh, in, from the beginning of 2004. I think there's like a more than 15, maybe maybe even 20 countries in European Union. I don't actually know about the figures there. And there, there will be like 600 members in the parliament, and they are like voting there. You should have like, majority means like 300 members should vote for, for your ideals. It will be very difficult. Finland has like five members of parliament there or something like that. Yeah. that that's quite a tiny portion if you, if you need 300. Anyway, but if you, if you have this kind of network and you have lots of groups in different countries in Europe, we would like believe we could like uh, change their opinion too, at least in the future. And this patenting case is a good first example where we try to unite and deliver, try to stop the stupid idea of software patents there. <clears throat> so here, here is some kind of higher superstition of what we are really trying to do. If, if, if I need to put it in one sentence, it's like, we are human change agent. I have read Peter Trucker's book, Managing Nonprofit Organization, and this is his message, and it's, it's quite good, I think. The idea is to change the perception of individual people, policy makers, those who have power of the things which are in the society right now. You should like to understand that some laws make, may, may be bad laws and may, may be like threatening from our perspective. And the basic premise there is that uh, politicians do not know. They rely on sources which are like, uh, that they are not like informed as we are. Okay, there's the presumption that we are right. Of course, we can be wrong too. And hackers have been wrong in many, many issues which are not like tech related before. But that's the premise we must work on. And uh, we try to change the message, of course, of their sources, too. We try to influence the mass media they are like, listening to. We try to change the perception of, of their like, uh, experts they, they like trust. 
And uh, of course, we must understand that there's still like lots of ignorance among politicians, especially those who are elder and uh, European in, in for reasons unknown. Especially like Southern Europe is very like a, it's like a, maybe five years after what Northern Europe is in, in technological progress. There is not many internet accesses in. A, Southern European countries compared to the population, if you compare it to Northern Europe. That's like a problem in Europe. This was your slide. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope that at this point uh, at least some of you are asking, so what I can do? And uh, there's a lot of answers to this, that question, and uh, of course the easiest one, and to give somebody money to somebody else to do the job. And it's actually not a good strategy. For example, the folks in the EFF in the United States are doing ex extremely nice job. And uh, for, for us, it's also very important that we get some funding to be able to do the day-to-day -day -day tasks. And uh, of course, if a person wants to do more, there is an uh, other possibility, because uh, which is to become an activist. and. Uh, Again, here are uh, two possibilities to just uh, be an unorganized or uh, just uh, act alone or perhaps uh, sometimes participate to some organized events but, uh, in a bigger, uh, just, uh, well, in practice, just uh, do, do your stuff by yourself. Or another option is uh, organized activism, or start your own association or start doing these kind of things. And uh, these are actually both very important. Uh, for example, uh, unorganized activism in practice means that, uh, for example, if a person, uh, uh, for example, if there is some kind of logo, law uh, introduced in Parliament, but you just uh, tell your friends what's going on and perhaps say that uh, please contact some person in Parliament and try to get other people active. This is very important. Uh, well, we have been talking quite a lot of, about organized activism already. And uh, it's uh, also very important because in practice uh, only organized activism, uh, activists get access to parliament and uh, get, a, get a chance to get to the hearings and uh, so on. And of course, uh, one of the good reasons to start doing it is that uh, it actually can be fun. Or at least I think that uh, both Mikko and me have had a lot of fun doing this stuff and uh, it's always nice to be so organization like uh, ARI. AA, or it's in our case the Finnish version of it, and of course the one part of it. But uh, if you're really lucky, you manage to, you ma might be even able to get to the DEFCON for free. Okay, and what's effective activism? For example, uh, DDoSing real website is not. Uh, in in practice, uh, if you do something like that, uh, it doesn't really hurt. Them. It just uh, gives me more, more reasons to claim to U.S. Congress that uh, okay, these guys are criminals and these are doing a lot of nasty stuff and so on. Not a good idea. Uh, instead, for example, uh, uh, study some how, for example, how copy protection system works on CDs and then create a scientific or pseudo scientific article out of it. Of course, uh, this can be. Uh, bit legally riskful in Europe, uh, it most likely isn't, but in the United States it, it might be. And uh, to get this kind of uh, information out, it's uh, always good to have, for example, uh, anonymous P2P systems like Freenet. And uh, helping people to code these kind of systems is definitely something that uh, people should help. And uh, another thing is that. Uh, uh, in practice, uh, well, of course, uh, uh, politicians uh, more or less get their signals from the uh, media and uh, they follow what's going on from media mostly. And uh, that means that if you want to get a message through, you have to get to the media. And uh, in practice, it's too expensive to buy advertisements. Uh, some bigger organizations have nowadays resources for it. For, to, for example, for us, it's a totally out of question. Um, instead of uh, we have been learned how to use so-called free press. Uh, actually, the newspapers uh, like to get the material which is easy to publish, and uh, if you know how to write a press release, this is very easy to convert to a news story. 
have uh, lazy reporters take this material and uh, use it. And uh, I guess so far uh, all of our press releases have been published in at least one newspaper or web, web magazine. <coughs> we also learned by experience that you should have quotes in your press releases. Many newspapers do not publish press releases, press, <coughs> press releases which are like written uh, that you like. You make a statement there. That's not a good idea. You should have a statement, but you should also have like quotes. Of, this person says this thing. Other person says this thing. That's a good, good press release. Yeah, Just much wider coverage. And because as a result, a reporter can write the article that way, but it uh, seems that uh, uh, she or he uh, had been interviewing that person. Mm -hmm. Right. So, well, they, they publish lots of articles. Lots of articles in newspapers with like, really like they are like interviews are actually from press releases where you have like a written quotes. Some, some person in the media department has like a figured out this is a good quote, let's write it there and put some CEO's name in there. That's the reality. <laughs> yeah. From my experience at least. Mm. Another one is, I guess, uh, Miko this is uh, arranging pickets. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's, it's a very effective way to get media attention because uh, if you speak about um, some very boring topic like copyright, generally speaking, uh, it's not a nice story for media, and especially for TV. It doesn't look good to have uh, to have some guy next to the computer or something and talking about blah blah copyright blah blah. Uh, instead of uh, having a couple of guys uh, outside some places uh, having funny looking signs and. Uh, doing stuff, it's a much, much bigger news story immediately, and uh, that's actually one of the ways to get uh, quite easily free media. I think Greenpeace has an image problem, also they have a funding problem. We are a very small organization, and unless you have lots of resources, I think it's just very risky to do pickets and do this kind of civil yeah. obedience and support it. Uh, but it's nevertheless, different. nevertheless, uh, Greenpeace uh, really masters this picketing. Uh, Greenpeace is a very big organization. They have yeah, like yeah, but, uh, resources. Uh, and they, they uh, have uh, but you can also learn how to mimic their strategies. But anyway, yeah. as you can see, we disagree with Miko about this We don't this do point. this kind of stuff yet, as of yet. Yeah. And uh, anyway, of course, there's an, uh, this so-called anti-globalization movement style, which is um, practically uh, causing or arranging riots outside the meeting place where different international treaties are being negotiated. Uh, and, uh, where do you get 10,000 hackers to and protest that's, that's that a point. Uh, for, for us it's not possible, but, uh, and uh, second of all, it's actually not a good press, or at least from my point of view, anti-globalization movement has managed to create an image that these people don't know anything about the content, these are just out and riot and uh, destroy places, and uh, it's never good for getting your message through. And, uh, well, this is a bit riskful one because, um, well, actually, this is what lawyers do. Uh, we are more or less trained to look for legal exploits or to find out uh, where loopholes in laws are about the same as bugs uh, in code, if you want to compare. And uh, if you learn how to find loopholes, uh, it definitely helps for you. Um, let's take a practical example. Uh, okay, this is a uh, typical part of law, it's out of uh, EU copyright directive and uh, uh, this section more or less makes it illegal to, for example, uh, create uh, a software like uh, uh, the CCS or whatever is used to break DVD encryption. Uh, but uh, instead of releasing uh, such a software of its uh, uh, encrypts, uh, oh, sorry, decrypts per DVD, uh, it's uh, possible to create a uh, program which has a commercially significant purpose. For example, you uh, create a small DVD player and uh, release it as an open source and uh, this uh, program uh, has inside it the needed code for encrypt, uh, decrypting the DVD. And as a result, uh, at least it should be legal in Europe. Of course, for example, here is um, this uh, ANC has to be also fulfilled. Uh, but typically nobody wants to market uh, a circuit facing tool as such. That's yours. So, so this is kind of like a... Just a think about it. Should you find an association if you find some, some issue in, in political arena or, or in law, like a uh, disgusting? Maybe you should first check if there's like a, any or 
active organization like EFF here or any other organization in your state or country or what regional level you're working on or living in. Uh, if you're not like happy what they are doing, try to influence them. I think, for example, EFF is is very difficult to influence in at the moment. At least they have like they have like 10,000 members, but uh, who is actually making decisions decisions there? I think they have had the, had the same board practically the last 10 years. If you want to be a board member there, don't even think about it. You you need to find an, <coughs> a, practically found your own association here. This is kind of criticism, but it's reality. Uh, uh, so, if it's not like possible to hijack an existing organization, you have to find your own. Uh, how to make it thriving, that's the big problem. It's, of course, easier to do it with the existing organization, but if it's not possible, then you have to find your, your way to do it. And, of course, what matters is the results not the means to the end. And uh, the easiest way to the goal is, is of course the best one. So what do you have there? Here is some like a uh, wrap up of our, our experience, what, what you should do if you want to find a member organization. First of all, make it such that there's like individual members and people like feel they, they belong, belong into the organization and there is little, little like people you are moving from one place to other, or people who you are like uh, on, on be behalf of whom you are like speaking. Or speaking. <clears throat> try to ally with other other groups and try to make like uh, together any press releases or any activism. It's a good idea. Publish often like press releases and try to get respectable name in your region and try to get to the media very good to know many journalists and have friends and allies, allies there. Uh, and uh, I think it's also very important to speak like roughly and straight in like a, in, not, not, not in slang language but, but in straight language and uh, make short comments and such comments that journalists can like uh, further develop and find more arguments in support and again. And uh, of course, you must make direct, uh, direct like uh, communication between policymakers. This, this is very time consuming and takes lots of resources to call all the politicians who are making an important decision somewhere. And those politicians get lots of calls anyway. So how, how, do, how, how can you get your message through? It's, it's really like a tough job especially if nobody pays for it. Okay, this is our sla <coughs> last slide after questions. Uh, I guess the idea is there that we have given these teasers to other people too. We have them here. I guess the idea here was that uh, people throw these teasers to or any kind of free material to audience member, what is the yeah. idea here? Yeah, I, so. I think I can show you one, one t-shirt. I first like this one was in here. It's Excel size. These are most most like a popular model. <laughs> this is commercial presentation and uh, if you if you want to cut this just say our organization is here in Jose Finnish and the back we have this uh, Facebook inspired like a statement. Do the cookie, do the advert, do the media conferences, do the corporate life, do the fucking banner advertisement. Do the corporate companies and DVDs you can't play on your year of your choice. Do spam. Do the unsta unstable operating system, unfair end user license agreements and annual licensing fees. Do the digital television, viewing personal advertisement. <coughs> Choose government surveillance. Choose laws brought to you by American Entertainment Industry China. <laughs> Choose an ISP wondering who else reads your email. Choose sitting on a cot watching mind numbly spirit trust in real TV shows. Stuffing some food into your mouth. Choose spending the rest of your years as nothing more than a mindless consumer statistic. 
and the sales is pretty asshole if you help us turn culture into money making media playground. Choose your future. That's our statement. <laughs> I like the owners there. We have also like a couple more teasers here. These are for sale. 20 bucks piece. If you have any questions, just direct them. Yes, sir. It's been implemented, I think, like in uh, four countries at the moment. Like, it, first it was implemented in Denmark, Greece, and then uh, uh, what, what country is now implemented in? I think it's Germany and... Uh, in Germany it's implemented too, and then some other country too. But it's going on at the moment, that, and I think within a year it's almost in any, every country in Europe. But it's still going on. The deadline was in like the la last December, but by the deadline only like Greece and Denmark were able to do it. Anything else? Yes, sir. I don't support picketing, but maybe Ville does. Uh, it depends. Uh, uh, if you can, well, picketing itself doesn't really matter, but if you manage to get your picket into a t television, then it's good. Uh, generally speaking, well, of course, at least in Europe, uh, the politicians are very used to pickets, and you have to rent something very big uh, in order to get any really media attention. To the, uh, on the other hand, on this question, is it's um, just an just uh, so rare event that uh, let's say hackers go out and pick it but uh, I guess at least some media would make uh, just a story out of it that uh, it's possible to see hackers outside or something like that so yes sir We were actually last year on. Uh, we have a parliamentary elections in Finland, and uh, we were trying to create a so-called uh, election uh, search machine. So we were asking questions out of politicians uh, about uh, all of topic which very important for us, and created a database out of that info information so that the uh, members could uh, search uh, what uh, different candidates think. But we don't directly things. like support any candidates. We, we just we try just to make, it, make the decision out. easier for informed hackers. And we will like try to act as a, a kind of a mediator between individuals and the policymakers. So and if, if anyone has a, a question in, in Finland to some parliament members, we can try to ask the question directly. Yeah, and anyway, it's, um, for, for an organization, it's uh, very riskful to be connected to direct, uh, directly to certain politicians because, uh, for example, if you are in good relationships to the left leftist parties or to the Green Party, uh, the conservative side of the political spectrum start to hate you. And, uh, of course, it's uh, not a good idea if uh, conservatives are in power. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's the same thing in Europe, and uh, at least in Brussels, if you want to name one party which is like more supportive to our ideals, is the Green Party, which is like basically leftist party in Europe, and then you have a Radical Party. That's like a well, it's a more or less like center, a, center. It doesn't. Uh, it's well, not it's real it, party there. It's impossible to put it on a left or right uh, line in traditional sense. Uh, but on the other hand, we have also some conservatives, conservatives which are in favor of us. So I guess it's the same. This is not a traditional right left wing question at all, or these questions are. A kind of problem in Europe is that there's not like strong liberal parties there, which could be like supportive. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry? 
Yep. Yeah, basically, or a libertarian, I guess, libertarian or whatever, but those different. parties are not that strong in Europe. Like, uh, for example, in Finland, there is such a party, and I think in every European country, there are practically, uh, in principle, is such a party, but in practice, they don't have any members in parliament or anything. It's the Sov Soviet Russia thing, <laughs> you know. We had this big power there a couple of years back. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I'll be done. Thank you.